I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Silverstein with us today. Uh, by way of introduction, Professor Silverstein has done something that I dream of doing, and that always impresses me the most when I can introduce those kinds of people. He has published a book that is relevant 10 years later. And not only is it relevant, it's even more relevant now than it was 10 years ago when he published it. And he just told me that he's happy with the argument and he wouldn't change it. Now that is an accomplishment, to make an argument that is relevant 10 years later and you don't really want to change, um, something I dream of. So Professor Silverstein is here to talk about uh, the topic of that book, which was imbalance of powers, constitutional interpretation, and the making of American foreign policy. He is an expert in constitutional law and judicial politics more generally. He's currently working on a book on how uh, law influences politics in the United States. Uh, the book is uh, titled uh, was it, How Law Kills Politics, which should be forthcoming soon. He's also working on a project on comparing judicial review in various countries in the world. He teaches at the University of California, Berkeley. He teaches classes in constitutional law, civil liberties, comparative constitutionalism, separation of powers. And uh, he received his PhD previously. He, he received his undergraduate education at Cornell. And he worked as a journalist for the Wall Street Journal and for the San, San Francisco Chronicle and earned his PhD at Harvard. So please join me in welcoming Professor Silverstein with us today. Well, thank, thanks very much. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I, I've uh, only been in Utah once, and that was down in Mount Zion uh, National Park, so it's a, it's a real treat to see a, a different part of Utah and a different part of the United States. I, I've taught in a lot of different places, and uh, as I just mentioned Professor Hawkins, I, I, I like to say I'm one of the few people who teaches American politics who's lived in America. Um, of course, now I live in Berkeley, so uh, <laughs> that may no longer apply. Um, Actually, is there? I, yeah, the just the back, yeah. just this Whoops. back row. If you can yeah, get it. great. That one. Okay. Um, well, th as 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 Professor Hogan said, this book, uh, I really do feel there's not one word in it I would change. It needs obviously a new chapter to bring it up to date, um, but the same uh, basic arguments I think apply. And my interest is really in uh, understanding the ways in which uh, the American institutions interact with each other and the constraints of the of the constitutional system and how. Uh, how they interplay. So regardless of where your politics are, uh, these are kinds of questions about how institutions structure incentives uh, and how they uh, constrain choices. Um, but of course, this all takes place within a political context, and that's an important part of this story. Um, and so maybe that's the best place to start. Uh, President Bush's uh, approval ratings, um, which had soared uh, on September uh, 12, uh, 2001, um, have been in a steady free fall since then, uh, and they, uh, as you can see from this uh, chart. Uh, so they absolutely topped out, obviously, on 9-11, uh, um, and they've been falling ever since. And uh, what happened was that they actually, uh, the, the approval and disapproval crossed over. And this is a magic line no politician ever wants to experience. Um, two things to note about it is, is obviously this crossover, and then it continued uh, to develop. And secondly, uh, that there's almost no undecideds. This is a very polarized country, and people all have an opinion about uh, the president one way or the other. Either they approve or they disapprove. The undecideds, which is not on here, is buried from 1% to 3%, which is very, very small. So you could imagine uh, people's approval ratings going down, but what they might be doing is shifting from approval to uh, neutral, and they didn't. They, they flipped over from approval to disapproval. Um, and so this is obviously uh, a, a great concern to any political leader. Um, now, this is one thing to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, what also has been happening at the same time is the administration, uh, this administration, has been making possibly the boldest assertions of executive prerogative power uh, since Richard Nixon, and in some ways actually more explicit and, uh, and, and sort of more thought out. Um, in 2005, in December 2005, uh, President Bush signed a law that uh, passed 90 to 9 in a Republican Senate uh, that explicitly sought to limit and define the sorts of interrogation methods that would be allowed. Um, but when he signed the law, uh, he also uh, announced uh, in, a, in a what's called a signing statement um, that uh, 
the executive branch shall construe uh, Title X in this division relating to detainees in a manner consistent with the constitutional authority of the President to supervise the unitary executive branch and as Commander-in-Chief and consistent with the constitutional limitations on the judicial power. So there's two very important claims in there. One is that the President is going to continue to uh, interpret and apply the Constitution uh, under what the President sees as his constitutional, independent constitutional authority, regardless of what the law itself may say. And secondly, that they will do so uh, consistent with constitutional limitations on the judicial power. Um, and, of course, this suggests the possibility that should the court rule against uh, the administration, they could conceivably argue that this is beyond the court's authority um, and go ahead uh, and do what they plan to do in the first place. Um, now, in March of, uh, of this year, he also we learned that he had also uh, issued a signing statement uh, in the renewal of the Patriot Act where you see a similar uh, provision. Um, that the executive branch will construe provisions uh, that call for furnishing information to entities outside the executive branch in a manner consistent with the president's constitutional authority to supervise the unitary executive branch. So again, uh, uh, an independent constitutional claim that uh, in this case, of course, is not a major problem. He's got tremendous support from both houses of Congress and uh, generally a pretty supportive Supreme Court. But nevertheless, he's laying down a marker uh, should they want to uh, act on this down the road. So at the core of these uh, statements is the assertion that the president alone has the legitimate power and authority to determine how and when and what to do in areas that the president alone has decided belong exclusively to the president. Um, and among those powers are his assertion that the president can determine how and when to seize, hold, try, and release prisoners captured in uh, the war against terrorism. Um, and that really is at the core of uh, a case that was handed down in June of this year, the Hamden versus Rumsfeld case. Um, now, this was an unusual case in a number of ways, one of which was because Chief Justice Roberts did not participate in the case. And he didn't participate because he had made the decision when this case was at the lower court, in the appeals court, where he sat as a judge. So he couldn't uh, sit in judgment on his own judgment. And so he had to recuse himself, uh, which left a shorthanded court. Um, so, uh, in, and I'll, I'm going to come back to this case and to these signing statements at the end, but I just want to put this out uh, there for you to keep in the back of your mind. Um, this is, therefore, I think, between the signing statements, the cases that have been coming down, uh, various sorts of new problems, which we've never anticipated, obviously, uh, a very appropriate time to talk about the Constitution and American foreign policy. Um, so where are we? The president asserts uh, unitary and unified control in language we really haven't seen uh, since Richard Nixon left office. And I'll give you a taste of that. Uh, there was a surprisingly candid moment after Nixon left office. He finally granted one interview uh, to a British interviewer, a uh, journalist named David Frost. Um, and in that interview, which is really the only time he's really talked publicly and on the record and uh, in a filmed environment about some of these uh, issues, uh, there was an interesting exchange. Um, and so uh, Frost uh, says, uh, so what, in a sense, you're saying is that there are certain situations where the president can decide that it's in the best interest of the nation or something and do something illegal. Nixon, well, when the president does it, that means it's not illegal. Mm -hmm. Frost, by definition? Nixon, exactly, uh, exactly. If the president, for example, approves something because of the national security, or in this case because of a threat to internal peace and order of significant magnitude, then the president's decision in that instance is one that enables those who carry it out to carry it out without violating a law. Otherwise, they're in an impossible situation. Um, Frost, is there anything in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights that suggests the president is that far of a sovereign, that far above the law? Nixon, no, there isn't. There's nothing specific that the Constitution contemplates in that respect. I haven't read every word, every jot, every tittle, but I do know this. As far as a president is concerned, that in wartime, a president does have certain extraordinary powers which would make acts that would otherwise be unlawful, lawful if undertaken for the purpose of preserving the nation and the Constitution, which is essential for the rights we're talking about. Um, well, this is not that dissimilar to the sorts of arguments that the current administration is advancing. And, and these are serious arguments, uh, and they're serious problems. Um, how do you uh, fulfill your mandate to protect and defend the country and protect and defend the Constitution and yet work within the constraints of a document which is essentially about limits on power? I mean, the Constitution, the American constitutional system, is primarily a document of limits, of, what, uh, of, of limitations on government. It's not a document that was designed to make government easy, 
or to make a major change easy. In fact, it's very, very difficult. There's all sorts of checks and balances built in. Uh, you have to get a bill through the Senate. You have to get it through the House. You've got uh, all the states to deal with. There are all sorts of checks uh, that are built into the system. Um, all right, so there's a couple of questions then uh, that we can uh, think about. Um, first question uh, is, uh, is Bush right? Does the Constitution actually support his administration's claims uh, to dominance in foreign policy? Um, and if so, uh, what is the proper role for Congress? Uh, and if not, uh, what can or should Congress do? Um, a third question is, what's the proper role for the federal courts uh, and for the Supreme Court? What should the court do if there were a contest over these kinds of issues, if there was a struggle for control? And then finally, uh, and maybe most importantly, uh, what can or should the president himself do and why? Um, and to give you a hint, this is going to bring us back to those poll numbers that I started with. Um, well, I'm going to actually start with a third question about the courts uh, and then return to it uh, again towards the end, since for me most things start and end with, with the Constitution and the courts. Um, okay, well, uh, it's been it's long been assumed that foreign policy is different, that the court uh, simply gets out of the way. Uh, and when it comes to foreign policy, that this is something the court simply hasn't done very much of. And when I started the research on my dissertation, which became the, this, the book, which is behind this talk, uh, that seemed to be the dominant uh, theme. There was one book uh, that had been written. This is back in the uh, late 1980s. There was one book by a law professor at Columbia called Foreign Policy and the Constitution. It was dusty. Nobody paid any attention to it. Uh, nobody was particularly interested in it. Um, but it turns out that uh, the courts had done quite a bit, quite a bit more than uh, people had thought. And uh, uh, we can start by uh, looking back to Justice Frankfurter. There was a case, this is during the Cold War, uh, and, and in this case, uh, Justice Frankfurter said the court has repeatedly endorsed statements such as, uh, such as uh, Frankfurter's that broad as the power in the national government to regulate foreign affairs must necessarily be, and so he acknowledges that there's a greater latitude in foreign affairs, it is not without limitation. The restrictions confining Congress and the exercise of any of the powers expressly delegated to it in the Constitution apply with equal vigor when that body seeks to regulate relations with other nations. So the problem, of course, is how do you enforce these constraints, if they do exist, and Frankfurt is asserting that they do, without imperiling the nation? I mean, at what point? And this is the classic dilemma. How do you make that trade-off? Uh, the court in, uh, in 1967 uh, case uh, said, and this is a famous case that you've seen quoted recently, while the Constitution protects against invasions of individual rights, it's not a suicide pact. And so at what point do you sort of stand with the rules, even if that means uh, that the country is put at risk? And at what point do you ignore or expand or put away the rules uh, for survival? Well, uh, so at, and on the one hand, we've got this case where the court says the Constitution is not a suicide pact. But on the other hand, in the same year, in another case, the court said uh, that the justices accepted the notion that foreign policy uh, cannot be uh, completely unconstrained. Um, that they would be ignoring their duty and legitimating laws that would sanction the subversion of one of these liberties, uh, which makes the defense of the nation worthwhile. So the other side of the coin is, well, you know, you don't want to give up everything that you believe in, everything you're fighting for, for survival. Uh, and after all, as, as high a priority as life is, think of all the famous lines, you know, give me liberty or give me death, better dead than red. People do have things they are willing to die for. There are uh, principles and ideals that people think uh, are uh, of a higher value, and of course that's something we can debate about, but we do have these kind of countervailing pressures. Well, there's three critical Supreme Court cases that do come up that you may have heard uh, that are often misquoted and misunderstood, uh, which are at the core of this. The first is a, a case called the United States versus Curtis Wright Export Corporation in 1936. Uh, the second is a case called Youngstown Sheet and Tube versus Sawyer, the steel seizure case of 1952. Uh, and then a third is a case from 1981 uh, in the wake of the hostage seizure in Iran uh, called Dames and Moore versus Reagan. And this is Reagan, not Reagan. There's a, uh, he was a cabinet secretary for Reagan, so it gets a little confusing. Um, 
Let me walk through these very, very quickly to give you a sense of what the problem is. Uh, the first one is, is Curtis Wright. Uh, and uh, this is a combination of a guy named Glenn Curtis and the Wright brothers. Uh, they went into business together uh, to form a, a corporation that uh, was making a lot of airplanes, but also making other military munitions, including these nifty machine guns down here. Um, and uh, this is a often misunderstood decision uh, that's widely cited as a basis for executive war powers. But this is a case that was not actually about war powers, and that's why it's confusing. The justice in the case uh, wrote about this, um, but didn't need to. It's not really what the case was about. The central issue here had to do with delegation of power, whether or not Congress could delegate to the president the power to make a choice about limiting arms exports uh, to uh, the countries that were involved in a, in a war in South America, Paraguay uh, and uh, Bolivia. And so what happened was Congress wanted to give the president some flexibility uh, in using this as a kind of a carrot and stick, whether or not to suspend arms sales. And so they passed this legislation uh, which gave the president the discretion as to whether or not to impose these kinds of sanctions. So the question, the constitutional question was, could Congress give the president the discretion? It wasn't a question about whether or not the president, or I'm sorry, whether or not the government, the national government as a whole, could uh, limit arms sales. Um, and so this has become uh, understood or thought about as a question about presidential power. But again, the holding itself, what the case actually says, is not a question about presidential power. It's whether Congress has the power to delegate its discretion to the president. Well, there's a, a number of famous quotes in this case that, that do come up. And, and uh, Justice Sutherland, uh, George Sutherland, was the guy who wrote the opinion here. Um, and he's an interesting guy. He w had been a U.S. senator before going to the Supreme Court. In fact, he'd been the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And one of the dilemmas that he had was that uh, he was there during the World War I. And he had been, was and still was on the court, a very conservative uh, 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 senator and, and judge, and uh, what he was uh, particularly interested in, as were many folks of that era, was protecting uh, the autonomy of the states, federalism. He was primarily interested in federalism. And yet, coming out of World War I, he realized that there was a problem, uh, which is that uh, if you have a very weak central government, which is essentially what he had been advocating uh, prior to World War I, what happens when the world comes knocking at your door? Because after all, the fight of war uh, requires a strong central government, it requires efficiency, it requires all these things that are really antithetical to somebody who's interested in constraining government power generally. And so he struggled to come up with a way to read the Constitution uh, so that it would allow the national government to be active and strong in foreign affairs and yet not allow that to spill over and give the national government power against the states in domestic affairs. Now, that's a really tough thing to do if you read the Constitution because the Constitution doesn't have a separate foreign affairs chapter. It doesn't sort of separate foreign and domestic power. So you can read the Constitution pretty easily to say it gives tremendous power to government, or you could read it to say it gives very little power to government. There are ways of easily understanding the Constitution on both of those dimensions. But it's very hard to read it so that it gives great power in foreign affairs, but not so much power in domestic affairs. So that's the background of what Sutherland was, was, was interested in doing. And so at one point in the decision, he says, it's important to bear in mind that we are here dealing not alone with an authority vested in the president by the exertion of legislative power, but with such an authority, plus the very delicate, plenary, and exclusive power of the president as the sole organ of the federal government in the field of international relations, a power which does not require as a basis for its exercise an act of Congress. Well, this has been read as saying when it comes to foreign affairs, the president can do uh, almost anything. But that's not really what it says. Uh, it says that in addition to the power that has been vested in the president by the legislature, there are things the president can do alone. And he uses this line about the sole organ of the federal government. Well, that's a line that actually Chief Justice Marshall first came up with, and he came up with it when he was a member of Congress. But the context of that line, when Marshall used it, it has to do with the president as the spokesperson for the United States, that only one person speaks on behalf of the United States. And that's really the meaning of this phrase, sole organ, that this is the person who has the authority to speak on behalf of the United States. In any event, we can have a lot of discussion about this, but the case itself, as I said, the ruling itself was, can Congress delegate this power to the president? So in this case, there was a legislative act that was adding to whatever independent powers the president had. And that's the core of this particular case. 
Um, and in this decision, as I said, Sutherland made it clear that this was a case of national power. Congress, together with the president, uh, had passed this law, and was that law constitutional? Um, Congress had delegated power. That was added to whatever the president's own powers were, and that, therefore, gave you the highest level of authority for the national government. However, Sutherland did add immediately after that, he said, this is a power which does not require as a basis for its, uh, uh, for its exercise an act of Congress, but which, of course, like every, uh, every other governmental power, must be exercised in subordination to the applicable provisions of the Constitution. So he's certainly suggesting that there may be a broader ambit for national power when it comes to foreign policy, but even then, when you run into an explicit constraint in the Constitution, that has to stand. Uh, that's certainly what he's suggesting here. So this power, the national government acting together, even this power is limited by the explicit provisions of the Constitution. All right, so that's the first big case that gets mentioned a lot. The next one is, is Youngstown Sheet and Tube versus Sawyer, the steel seizure case. Uh, and this is a case during the Korean War. Uh, there had been um, uh, the steel mills in, in the United States, uh, the folks, the workers in the steel mills hadn't gotten a raise basically throughout the Second World War for wage and price control reasons and, and to uh, guarantee the flow of, of, of material and so forth. And so it had been a very long time. These folks had not gotten a raise. Uh, they wanted a raise. Um, and they now had uh, a, a president in office. And frankly, Truman was in a lot of political trouble at this time. Uh, probably the only reliable political support he had was the unions. Uh, and so the last thing he wanted to do was to force these folks to continue to work without uh, a raise. And so it's a long story. I won't go into all the details. But in essence, he came up with a plan uh, whereby he took over the steel mills, uh, 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 had the national government uh, absorb the steel mills. The workers then were working for the national government. The government could then set both the rates and the profits. The money was still given back to the steel mill owners, but the national government was setting the profit rate. In other words, uh, when the workers said, we want a raise, uh, there were wage and price controls in place. And so the owners said, well, you can have a raise if we can get a higher price. Uh, but Truman want, was loath to do that because to raise the price of steel would have caused inflation through the entire system. Steel wasn't everything, right? It isn't anymore, but every car, every house, everything had steel in it. So you raise the price of steel a couple of pennies, and it's going to have a reverberation through the whole system. So the Truman's response was, you know, you are making a sufficient profit. You can pay these guys more and not raise your prices. The steel mill owners said no, and that's where we got this impasse. All right, so there are... In this case, uh, Justice Jackson comes up with these famous three categories, and these are still basically what we're arguing about today. And he said there's three ways, there's three uh, places that we can think of when it comes to presidential power and foreign policy. Uh, the first is when the president acts pursuant to an express or implied authorization of Congress. So when Congress explicitly passes a law to give the president power, then the president is at his highest level of power. The only thing he can't do, just as Sutherland said, is he still can't, Congress and the president together still can't violate some sort of explicit rules in the Constitution. However, uh, they can, uh, they have the greatest uh, latitude. The second category is when the president acts alone. This is what he called the zone of twilight. Congress is silent. The president acts. Uh, it's unclear whether the president is acting with uh, congressional authority. Here the president is uh, in kind of a dicey situation. And at this time, the kind of the tie went to the Congress. That was the way the court uh, saw it. And then the third category was when the president takes measures that are incompatible with the expressed or implied will of Congress. So acts against, Congress says no, the president says yes, you've got a conflict between them. And at that point, uh, Jackson said the president is at his weakest position. The only things he can do there is what the things the Constitution explicitly gives him the sole authority to do. All right, so Youngstown is a very different case than uh, than. Um, uh, Curtis Wright. This is a case, Youngstown is a case about executive power because here the president was acting either in category two or category three and this is where the debate came but nobody was saying that this was category one. I won't go into all the detail on that. But the bottom line is that the question here was what happens when the president acts independently without Congress or even against the will of Congress and the court said no. They ordered the president to return the steel mills. Uh, they ordered him to stand down and, and he did. Um, 
And what happened from this case is that we established kind of a default, uh, bottom line default assumption that tipped towards Congress. Congressional silence would not be enough to give the President the authority to move uh, independently uh, on solid constitutional grounds. All right, there's a third case in this set of cases then uh, in 1981, uh, the Dames and Moore case. Um, and uh, this is a very tricky situation. This was at the end of the hostage crisis in 1981. It was a very complicated deal that was worked out to get the hostages back. Uh, and, I mean, very complicated deal. And it was all put together. It was all, uh, uh, everything clicked uh, on Inauguration Day as President Reagan came into office and President Carter left office. Uh, the entire thing was hinged on all sorts of financial transactions being delegated away from the U.S. courts and to an international tribunal. Uh, this is uh, because what we had done was frozen the assets of the Iranians. So we had tremendous leverage, financial leverage. They wanted their money back. Uh, we wanted our hostages back. They didn't trust uh, U.S. courts to make those decisions, and so we agreed to shift all those claims and disputes to an international tribunal. Well, domestic companies like the Dames and Moore Company uh, said, no, you know, we've got rights, we've, we've got bills, we've got obligations from Iran, and we don't want to trust an international tribunal with these. We have a right to bring these cases in American courts. And so they challenged this decision. Now, here's the problem. If the court overturns uh, that treaty, those, those agreements that we made to get the hostages free. Well, we had the hostages. They weren't going to be in jeopardy. But the problem was what happens down the road. If, if a president the next time can't make these negotiations because some foreign country would say, well, you know, look what happened the last time. We, we're not going to make a deal with you because we can't count on it. This is a classic, I mean, this is a real serious problem, obviously. Uh, and now, with hindsight, we can see how serious it was. It wasn't just one aberration uh, in 1981. So what's the court going to do with this? Uh, constitutionally, you could certainly see the case on Dames and Moore's side. Um, but to overturn this decision would have been uh, very dangerous. So Justice Rehnquist, Chief Justice Rehnquist, uh, takes the case on and writes the majority opinion. Um, and he uh, blurs Jackson's three categories. Um, and really what happens with Dames and Moore is he kind of, if the balance had been tipping towards Congress with steel seizure, it begins to tip over back towards the president with Dames and Moore. Um, and this matters because it expands the area where the president can act independently. The, the, the scope of where the president could act before uh, was fairly narrow, right? That, the, that where the President and Congress acted together, the President had tremendous autonomy. Um, but as you moved into the other categories, uh, you didn't. So where there was congressional silence, uh, Youngstown said, uh, that equals disapproval. If you want to act, you're going to need Congress to explicitly give you authority to act. Well, this is really, I mean, this is simplifying it, but this is essentially what happens with Dames and Moore, is we now say, well, congressional silence, we're going to say, equals approval. Congress could still oppose the president. Congress could go, uh, and, and in that case, uh, even Rehnquist is saying the president's going to lose. But if Congress is silent, our default assumption now is going to tip more towards saying that they approve of what the president's doing. And that expands, obviously, the scope of potential executive autonomy. Um, and what this means now institutionally is that Congress is going to have to act uh, affirmatively to stop a president. And that's a lot harder than you might think. And that's really where we get back to these institutional incentives. And the problem's a real simple one. Uh, because it takes 50% plus one to give the president power, right? If you want to pass a piece of legislation that's going to give the president power, it takes 50% of the Congress plus one, a majority, simple majority. But if you want to get that power back later, if you don't like what the president's doing with that power, then you pass a new piece of legislation, fine, 50% plus one. Then what happens? It gets vetoed. And if it gets vetoed, it has to be overturned. And to overturn it, you need 66%. And so it's a real simple equation. It takes 50% to give away power, and it takes 66% to get it back. Um, so clearly, you've got a, a, a problem with, with uh, reasserting your authority later on uh, if the default assumption uh, swings around. Um, now, the current administration uh, is making an even stronger argument for pushing that line further out, right? That even uh, in certain areas, particularly in areas concerning the war, 
the president uh, is, uh, is, can act against the will of Congress. It's not been a problem so far because Congress has essentially been very supportive of the president. But in principle, these arguments obviously have a much longer shelf life uh, with future presidents and future Congresses. And that's something you really have to bear in mind, and this is always a problem. Do, you know, these arguments are going to last. When you come to constitutional law, uh, you may well approve of the president and the current Congress and the current policy, but those laws, those rules, those interpretations of the Constitution are going to be there someday when you don't have a president you like or you don't have a Congress you like. Uh, and so you really have to think hard whether these are rules you can live with uh, should the political environment begin to change. All right, well, there's uh, been this kind of traditional interpretation of the Constitution and foreign policy. And despite regular pendulum swings in power between Congress and the executive, and despite the occasional intervention of the Supreme Court, certain fundamental assumptions about the Constitution and foreign policy developed early and have been steadily maintained. Um, and there's essentially three uh, sorts of criteria in this original understanding, this traditional interpretation. The national government, Congress and the president together, have broad but not unlimited power in foreign affairs. They still can't run up against an explicit prohibition. Specific limits or restrictions in the Constitution apply to foreign and domestic policy alike. And this, again, we've got a lot of cases going back a long time that have said this. And third, the Congress has, has constitutional authority cho should it choose to exercise that authority in foreign and domestic affairs alike. This is, as, in, as I'm saying, this is the traditional interpretation that the court has exercised. Um, and this goes back a long way. It goes back through uh, President Jefferson uh, and um, uh, Albert Gallatin, uh, President Jefferson's Secretary of the Treasury, who was worried about uh, uh, the exercise of extraordinary power in the Louisiana Purchase. Could we take over this enormous part of the country without a constitutional amendment, without constitutional authority? Um, Jefferson worried about this, and Jefferson uh, agonized about it. He wanted to go to Congress for authority. He wanted to even possibly get a constitutional amendment, but the clock was ticking on our ability to get the Louisiana Purchase, and there was a concern that there was going to be resistance in Congress, and so he was persuaded to do it independently. And he said he hoped that he wasn't going to make uh, a bad precedent here. And he said he hoped that the good sense of our country will correct the evil of construction when it shall produce ill effects. Uh, he said the Constitution, even though it's been violated, was on the whole safe. This precedent, though it was alarming, was exceptional, and he assumed that it would be seen as a unique one-off exception. Well, it wasn't, uh, and that's the problem with precedent. Once it's there, it sits around and it's available down the road. You have another example of this traditional uh, concern in, in Lincoln. Um, at the start of the Civil War, Lincoln delayed the recall of Congress. He exercised extraordinary emergency powers, uh, suspended the writ of habeas corpus, called in the troops, started a draft, did all sorts of things. Um, but then he goes to Congress uh, a year later on July 4th, 1861. It was no coincidence he chose to go on July 4th. Um, and he didn't go to argue that his actions were above or beyond the Constitution, but rather he went to seek the post hoc, after the fact, approval or rejection from legislators in Congress, acknowledging that it was their constitutional prerogative to have the ultimate say in these matters. And Lincoln's message to Congress was a tortured, uh, fascinating uh, speech, but ultimately it crafted a claim that the president, he said, might have to act in an emergency, but that the president acts in an emergency does not create, override, or substitute for the Constitution. And ultimately, the president would and should submit his action for ratification or rejection by Congress of the courts. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, he asked this question, which again gets quoted, but people don't quote the end of this quote. He asked this rhetorical question, are all the laws but one to go unexecuted and the government itself go to pieces, lest that one be violated? Even in such a case, would not the official oath be broken if the government should be overthrown when it was believed that disregarding the single law would preserve it? Well, that's the question he's asking. There's a question mark at the end of that. Um, and though he voices this as a genuine dilemma and seems to be paving the way to a new constitutional interpretation, he stops short and he steps back, and then he continues, which no one does quote, the next line. Uh, he says, look, might this be a concern? It might, but in this case, he said, he didn't have to face the dilemma. Uh, might it be necessary to violate a law? Maybe, but Lincoln insisted, 
that it was not believed that any law was violated. In view, full view of his great responsibility, the President has so far done what he has deemed his duty. You, Congress, will now, according to your own judgment, perform yours. And so even though this is a rhetoric, I mean, we're in the midst of the war, this Congress is not going to vote against what the President has done. Nevertheless, he is acknowledging that it is ultimately Congress's authority to make this choice. So that's a very different rhetoric than we're seeing, uh, that we saw in, with the Nixon administration and, the, and that we're seeing with uh, the Bush administration. And all three of these are Republicans, by the way, so this is not a partisan story. Um, okay, so uh, presidents like Adams and Jefferson and, and uh, Jackson, Polk, Lincoln, Teddy Roosevelt, they all pressed executive power to its constitutional limits. I mean, they were not shy about uh, using and pushing executive power, and sometimes even went beyond. But none of these folks ever made a constitutional argument that they had an independent constitutional authority to do this. They made pragmatic arguments. They pushed the limits of what they had. Not even Teddy Roosevelt, in some ways, was the kind of zenith of, of the aggressive, assertive president. Um, at one point, Teddy Roosevelt says, no president ought to content himself with the negative merit of keeping his talents undamaged in a napkin. Uh, this is not a man shy about the use of power. The president should do all he can to meet national needs, quote, unless such action was forbidden by the Constitution or by the laws. And so uh, even Teddy Roosevelt, at the zenith of the assertion of executive power, uh, wasn't making that kind of a claim. All right, so we've got a new interpretation, an executive prerogative interpretation, uh, which has now uh, been developed. Uh, and this didn't start with, it didn't start with Nixon and it didn't start with uh, Bush. It really starts with the Second World War. It really starts uh, with the end of the Second World War. There were two things that kind of generated uh, this new interpretation. Um, one was nuclear weapons. Uh, because this changed everything, um, this meant that there might be no time for deliberation. You know, it was one thing when we were three months by sea from Europe, and you had three months to figure out what you were going to do. You could call Congress into session. You could have debates and discussion. But even in the 1950s and 1960s, we were down to three hours for a missile, two hours for a missile, 40 minutes for a missile. You didn't have the time. And so the argument was we needed a more efficient decision-making authority. We had to give the president greater independent authority simply because the world had changed. Technology had changed. And uh, the other part of it was that this prolonged Cold War begins to fortify the argument for emergency power. What happened was we passed all sorts of statutes uh, at the end of the Second World War, some of them actually go back to the First World War, that generated emergency powers for the president. But the idea was emergencies are emergencies, and they're short and they're quick, and then we can kind of deal with them. But the problem with the Cold War was, for the first time in our history, an emergency takes, starts to last 10, 20, 30 years, and these statutes were still sitting on the books. And so at what point, and of course this is very relevant for us today, if we imagine that the war on terrorism could last 10, 20, 30 years, it could be the equivalent of the Cold War. And so the notion that you give the president that kind of immediate instantaneous uh, authority, do you really want that to be uh, extended over some indefinite period of time? Well, out of this, members of the executive branch begin to develop what you might call an executive prerogative interpretation that held that in foreign affairs, the president alone has the final authority, and when national security is imperiled, which is a judgment left to the executive, the president is legitimately entitled to override constitutional constraints uh, to preserve and protect that security. Um, well, this argument, as I said, was first articulated really late in the Roosevelt administration, but it's really Truman with the use of nuclear weapons that begins to do this. Uh, it's built on by uh, a little bit by Eisenhower. He wasn't quite as strong on this issue, but it really begins to flower under President Johnson, uh, President Kennedy, President Johnson, uh, and then President Nixon brings it to what we had thought was kind of the modern zenith of it. It recedes a little bit under Carter, uh, and uh, it begins to uh, reemerge, obviously, in the current administration. Um, all right, so uh, there were a number of efforts to do stuff about uh, the uh, use of power. The Vietnam War changed things. People began to worry about a president that had too much authority, the president was acting independently. And so we tried to pass statutes like the War Powers Resolution to bring Congress back into the picture. Um, that's another long story. I won't get into why, there's, uh, why that actually backfired, why in many ways the War Powers Resolution gives the president more power than it takes away. Um, but the difference is that we now have this assertion by presidents, going back to Truman, of the separate independent constitutional authority to act independently. 
All right, well, let me skip ahead now. I mean, what are the incentives to change this, if this is a problem at all? Now, you may not see this as a problem at all. You may be perfectly happy to see a very, very strong independent uh, power in the White House. But as I said, be careful about that because that cuts multiple ways uh, when you get a president who's doing things that you may not like. And the problem was this separation of foreign and domestic powers raises a very particular problem, which is it's impossible. You cannot separate foreign and domestic anymore if it ever was possible. And we began to see that uh, with Richard Nixon uh, again um, because uh, what happened was the argument was, look, if, if the president has to have this authority to deal with foreign enemies, well, what is the logic in saying that none of those powers can be exercised domestically? Because obviously our foreign enemies are operating domestically, and this is not new to the current war. You go back to the Cold War and the concerns about spies, the concerns about espionage, these were all there as well. And so, of course, logically, if the president is going to have this tremendous foreign policy powers, it's going to begin to seep back home. And that's exactly what old George Sutherland was worried about. He was worried about the national government using its centralized authority in foreign affairs to come back and exercise that same kind of power domestically. He thought he had solved the problem, and in some ways, perhaps for his age, it made some sense. But in an era of globalization, in an era of uh, mass communications, the idea of disaggregating these things and saying that we can really separate foreign and domestic becomes extremely difficult. Um, all right, so uh, it's no surprise, really, that Congress would uh, try to dump power, give this away to the president. So one argument is, well, why isn't Congress being more aggressive? There's no, there's no incentive for Congress to be a, a, aggressive. If things go well in any war, in any foreign policy crisis, the president's going to get all the credit, whoever the president is, because that's one of the things they have. They've got Air Force One. They've got brass bands. They've got the military. When you do things in foreign affairs, because the president's the sole organ, because the president speaks for the United States, of course he's going to get all the credit for things going well. So uh, there's no incentive. Uh, and if things go badly, whoever is responsible is going to get blamed. So why would Congress want to take a risk on things going badly, in which case they're going to get the blame as well as the president, and why not just give it away to the president and let him take the risks? So the argument is that it makes sense for Congress to have given away a lot of this power in foreign affairs. But counterintuitively, the argument is it's not so smart for presidents to take all this. It's kind of a Trojan horse uh, for the same reason, because if things go well, of course, they're going to get credit for it. But if they go badly, they really are on their own. And you can think about Bush's father. Things went spectacularly well in uh, the first war. Uh, we went in, we got out. It was relatively low uh, cost. And yet, uh, as that story began to emerge, and, and, and we know that uh, they decided not to go on to Baghdad, they didn't pursue the war, it starts to backfire against him, and it hurts him in his reelection bid. It was devastating for uh, Nixon to be responsible ultimately for the war. It was devastating for Johnson, who is pushed out of the race because he is seen as being responsible for the war. So you'd think that actually uh, a president who was primarily uh, worried about that would be much more cautious about the support, uh, assertion of independent power. And of course, you can see that this is, that's a big part of what this is tracking, right? At the initial point of the attack, the president's popularity is astronomical. He can do anything imaginable in, in, in domestic and foreign affairs. But as the war begins to drag out, as it begins to become more politically uh, difficult, his approval rating begins to sink. Now, Congress approval rating is in the toilet this whole time anyway. I mean, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. I could put that up here, but it would be pretty low there the whole way through. But it doesn't really change that much. The population, whether they like the war, they dislike the war, they aren't either blaming Congress or giving Congress credit for the war.